In animals, we um, find amyloidase rarely, but in phylogenetically diverse taxa, such as nematodes, crustaceans, and I think one fish species. So I am focusing, as I said, animals, I am focusing on amyloidase. And the conditions under which amyloidase is thought to evolve um, are that the female fitness gain curve is saturated and the male fitness gain curve is excelled. So we are asking now, can we actually test these predictions of sex allocation theory? Is there a way to um, figure out if in the natural populations, these are the under underlying fitness gain curves? However, generating fitness gain curves is notoriously difficult because you not only need to um, generate all kinds of different sex allocation patterns, but then you also need to attach fitness value to these sex allocations. However, we may think that size-specific reproductive investments is a kind of workaround of, of, of the problem. It, is, it occurs in populations with adults of varying size, and basically means that sex allocation varies or is different between small and large individuals. There are several other assumptions that need to be met for this to be true, which I'm not going to talk about right now. Um, however, there are two kind of rules that we can um, derive from this, and that is A, small individuals express the sex first with a more saturating fitness gain curve. Um, and that is the best way I can think about it because um, if you are small, you have fewer resources overall to allocate to reproduction. So you want to allocate them <coughs> to the function with the largest fitness gains. And the saturating player had these high fitness gains when there are few resources. And secondly, um, the fitness gain curve and site-specific reproductive investment curve should be of similar shape. By that, I just mean that um, a saturating fitness gain curve should also result in a uh, saturating site-specific reproductive investment. From this, we can um, derive three expectations for Andrew Ishii under uh, sex allocation theory. And that is first, that the male fitness gain, uh, sex, sorry, that the male size specific reproductive investment curve should be accelerating, because that was the shape of the um, fitness gain curve they expect. Secondly, that the female size specific reproductive investment curve is saturating. And lastly, that uh, Small hermaphrodites should first express the female function and later on a stable um, express both function. And that is because the more saturating fitness gain curve is the female. So we wanted to test these, uh, these predictions and our study system is the Andromedia spinal chlamydia test reading area. And Polonidia only lives on other animals, such as horseshoe crabs, as in this picture, but also blue crabs and sea turtles. The males are always dwarfed, uh, these white, white spots, and always attached to the hermaphrodite. That is important because this allowed us to distinguish between small hermaphrodites and males. So these are two drawings of the barnacle. This is from the underside, so basically where it attaches to the animal, if you turn that around, and then this is from the top. We assess uh, reproductive investment by measuring the egg volume, and these are the two like egg uh, masses that a, a hermaphrodite will have. Um, and obviously female reproductive investment was only assessed in the hermaphrodites, because males don't have that. And then as the male reproductive investment, we use penis length, and so the penis length. Um, our measure of size was uh, body weight. However, we found that there is a strong correlation between actual opercular length, which is this measure, and body weight. So we measured opercular length and then uh, calculated the length of body weight. And then, oh yeah, we also, to look at uh, small hermaphrodites, our females first, we just looked at the sex expression pattern, and for that we just used the absence or presence of the penis or the absence and presence of eggs as our um, uh, sex expression. Uh, going on to the results, we find that male reproductive investment actually saturates the size very significantly and um, quite dramatically. So here in this figure we have the calculated body weight, which is our size measure, and then 
And there was no difference neither for the host species that are collected the barnacles from, nor for the sex. So males and hermaphrodites show the same thing. And this is contradictory to our expectation derived from the sex allocation theory. Secondly, female reproductive investment also saturated in size, however, to a far uh, lesser degree. Um, but this is actually in concordance with our expectation. Here we have egg volume as a measure of female reproductive investment. And lastly, we found that hermaphrodites express the male sex when they are small. And I think this figure is, um, let me explain this figure real quick. So this is the proportion of hermaphrodites which express either sex. Um, and then on the uh, x-axis, again, we have the calculated quantity. So at a small size, um, there are much more hermaphrodites who are only male. And then there are you know, some who express both. But as they grow, there's, um, as, as the hermaphrodites grow, they express both the male and the female sex um, at equal and almost 100 years. And that is actually contradictory to our expectation because we, uh, the expectation, or the expectation was that a small individual, a small hermaphrodite should be, um, should be female. I also did a chi square test where basically you just counted how few I find in the, uh, hermaphrodites that are only male, hermaphrodites that are only female, hermaphrodites that are both, and there was a highly significant trend. I found, I think, in 1,200 barnacles that I looked at. I found four barnacles that were female but not male. Mm -hmm. So then in summary, we can conclude that sex allocation theory alone is unlikely to explain an Gaetian linear test scenario. However, there are other models out there both, which both combine like history and sex allocation theory. Um, in particular, they take the small size of the barnacle males into account. And I think this is important because small size may mean that uh, these males mature faster than the hermaphrodites. And if you think about where we find these barnacles, like on sea turtles, on horseshoe crabs, which um, die off faster, they shed their shells. So it seems as if these barnacles don't live long. So it might be a, a, a fitness advantage to have the small size and mature faster. And the last slide is unfortunately gone, but that was my thank you slide. I want to thank my lab mates who really helped me with this. Um, all the people who helped me collect, um, some are here, all the organizations that helped me, and my funding sources, that's University of Georgia and NSA. And with that, I will the questions. Thank you. Yeah. So it's two, one Ghana, but let me ask the question also. <laughs> um, I was wondering why you focused on penis size is the male investment rather than maybe the more traditional testes. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, and with, uh, yeah, I'm debating that myself. So there's some independent evidence that penis size actually is a relatively good approximation for male reproductive investment. Um, in part, it simply is the color of the barnacles. They are all white whereas most other inverts have some kind of coloration, these guys are white, as would testes and everything else be. So that was just a really, really difficult task. And then we wanted to increase our sample size, and um, dissecting our testes is just, it's a lot of work. Um, however, I am still debating whether I should maybe be try and stay in them and dissect, dissect them out to kind of like uh, validate my results. But yeah, good question. Yeah. Another yeah, question is related to that. If you consider the penis length, that there's going to be penis mass, and you plot that against the body weight, would you still expect to get that saturating function or weight? That's a very good idea. That might be. That's actually more feasible. Um, I still think that is going to be the case. So I've looked at all these, and they all seem to be the. Um, I guess the diameter seems to go out the same. I don't see much variation in that. And that would be the other thing to to change the the, the mass of the body. Yeah, just thinking that the, the mass would go up on the factor of three or the length. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. So that, that might change the saturating curve to, to linear. Shape. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think that's something that I definitely will consider. Yeah, I was just wondering how small are these hermaphrodites when they're colonized by males? Mm -hmm. Like, are they still female at that point? 
Well, they are male at that point, and they can be. Yes, they can be. Um, no, sorry, the the hermaphrodite. You said they go from making females to male, right? No. What we, so that oh. was our expectation. What we actually oh. found was that they go from male to female. Oh, okay. And um, when they do get colonized, I would say they are the size where they are mostly both male and female. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last talk of the session. Thank you.